This is DDS. From the DDS studios, we are your hosts, Blake Melton and Bradley Newberry. Matthew Parker, well, he's got the day off. But we have his picks. Yes, we do. Newberry, we have got another prediction show today. And why not? Absolutely. It's a a little bit closer to home to us. Yep. Talking ACC Coastal Division today. This is our ACC 2022 Coastal Division prediction show. We thank you all for joining us today. Go ahead while we we're sitting here and getting ready to, to launch this thing. Hit that like and subscribe button down below. It's quick. It's free. It's easy. Hit the rumble button on rumble. Check us out on all of our social media, Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. And you can get all the audio versions of all these podcasts on your favorite podcasting platform. Newberry, yeah. the ACC Coastal Division. What are we dealing with here today? We're going to start with the Duke Blue Devils. Mm. Dukey Duke. They Sorry, went. That made me almost lose. We're talking about football, right? I'm we are saying. talking Duke football. We have. Uh, oh, boy. We have done our preparations. We have read. We have researched. We have looked high and low on all of the teams. Yep. So even though we are not fans of of some of these or most of these teams. Yep. We do the research folks. Yep. We put in the work. Absolutely. We do. We're going to start with Duke last year. They went three and nine overall. Yep. Oh, in eight in ACC play Blake. They have a new head coach this year. Mr. Mike Elko. Uh, overall, this team has no bowl game since 2018 and they have lost 17 Out of the last 18 ACC games, anything stand out about the Duke Blue Devils football squad? Uh, Just how bad they are. I mean, look, the departure of David Cutcliffe, all respect to him, very highly respected coach no matter what Duke has done in the past. I mean, he's done things with them that no one would have ever thought would have been possible. What did we say? That he had three top 25s at Duke? Three or four. Three or four. I can't remember whatever it was. He had a 10-win season, a nine-win season. These are, I mean, again, we're talking about Duke, Duke football. football, folks. This is not something that uh, comes lightly. Uh, and you mentioned uh, Mike Elko, the defensive coordinator from Texas A&M, taking the head coaching job there. He's got Boy, a, did they need defensive help. Yeah, I'm finishing almost dead last, 127 <laughs> out of 130, giving up over 500 yards per game now they they had an average offense i would call it i mean they're they're over 400 on their on their offense per game but it is hard to win games whenever you give up over 500 yards in 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 total offense for to the other team and i I, and i'm forecasting it's going to be hard to change the culture in year one yeah i've personally seen it many times with some of my favorite teams in both college and the nfl it is a huge undertaking Right. Blake mentioned it, 517.9 yards per game, over 40 points allowed per game. Yikes. But that's his specialty, right? I mean, it's, I just think it's going to take a minute to get Well, there. and the good thing, I think, if you're Elko, uh, coming into this situation, Duke has shown that they are willing to be patient. I mean, they were, they were patient with Cutcliffe. They stuck with him for a very long time, even though – there wasn't always necessarily, you know, results on the field. Um, I think that their expectations are in the right spot. And I think that maybe if, you know, if he can come in there and turn the defense around, retool it a little bit, um, I think that maybe, look, this is the division that you can maybe sneak up on somebody in. Looks like their best player last year on offense was a running back. Just yeah. glancing at the numbers here. Yeah, it appears so. Mateo Durant, um, 1,241 yards yeah, over rushing, 1,200 yards, averaging 4.9. Yeah, and he, I mean, he caught some balls out of the out of the backfield, 256 yeah. uh, receiving. So I mean, they have a weapon. Yeah, basically. Well, but, and you know, they're going to be some... able to score 40 points a game. They can't do that. No. Well, I mean, it, it's unrealistic to expect expect to get a highly powered offensive team out of duke i think you've got to play defense you got to do the little things right got to play defense you got to kick and protect you got to make your field goals 
pin them back, get good field position. Got to you got to take advantage of all those things while you can. But as far as uh, our predictions for them, I'll go ahead and kick this off. I actually have them because I consider them. Uh, I consider one of the wins that I have them getting an upset. I've got them going three and nine this year. Okay. Uh, I think that they're going to, I think the upset that I'm talking about, I think they're going to beat Kansas. (laughs) I think they're going to beat the Kansas Jayhawks and go to a three and nine record. A note that I had on them is that they've won three in a row against Northwestern. I believe they have them in their week two game. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just this weird thing about Northwestern that we mentioned on one of our previous podcasts that this seems to be the bounce back year. It's like in every other year. So, yep. I have that as a loss um, this year. I have that they probably will beat NC, A and T, and Temple. Mm-hmm. I've got them predicted going two and ten, and uh, Parker has picked Duke at four and eight. So we're right there, two, three, four. We think that the uh, year one is just is what it is, and uh, it takes a little bit of time to change the culture there. Yeah, for Duke, absolutely. Georgia Tech moving down to the ATL. Okay. Last year they finished three and nine as well. They were two and six in ACC play. Coach Collins, he lost their leading rusher and their second leading receiver, Jameer Gibbs, after he transferred to Alabama. Roll Tide. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the head coach there. He is going to be on the hot seat. He's already on the hot seat, right? He's let his best players get away from him. Haven't had really much any success to speak of here uh, of recent years. Uh, and I don't, unfortunately for him, think that it's going to change. I think it will actually probably get a little worse. A lot of personnel turnover, too. I mean, mm-hmm. to your point, I think he's feeling the heat um, in an effort to – Mix it up. Try anything. He's turned over just about the entire staff. He's even brought in for the quarterback coach, Chris Winky. No, I knew that. I should have brought that up. <laughs> Man, I I, I, don't, I can promise you, as someone who's had to live through a few years of Chris Winky being on the staff, that's not going to help him at all. Okay. Um, but, I mean, they are a suffering offense and just a not very good defense either. I mean, uh where uh, Duke gave up over 500, well, you know, Georgia Tech gives up just over 450 per game. and they But they only – they don't play offense, really. They're averaging 365 yards per game. Uh, just a totally anemic offense, an awful defense, and they've gotten rid of some of those weapons that they had on offense. So that's just not spelling good news. For the Yellow Jackets. No. And we talked about uh, Duke earlier allowing 500 and almost 18 yards per game. Georgia Tech allowed 455 yards per game. Yeah. So, I mean, just and there's, just not, there's just not a lot of positive stuff to talk about with Jameer Gibbs departing. Um, there's just not. That can't be. I mean, that's a negative. Yeah. I mean, I, this guy was almost like a bell cow to them. You see it right there. 143 rushes. He added 35 more receptions. All of that production went to the SEC in Alabama. Yep. Uh, I mean, there's nothing much to say past that other than I guess I'll go ahead and let you know that I think they're going 2-10 and this year. I don't think this is going to be a good thing. uh, Their schedule looks absolutely horrid. Do you have it? Yeah, I do. So – Clemson, Western Carolina, Ole Miss, UCF, Pittsburgh, Duke, which they'll probably win, uh, Virginia, Florida State, Virginia Tech, Miami, North Carolina, and Georgia. Georgia. That's a that's murderer's row there at the end for them. So two and ten. Two and ten. I uh, I can't say that I have it much better. Actually, I've got it exactly the same. <laughs> I've got two and ten for Georgia Tech and Parker picks three and nine. Okay, for Georgia Tech. Okay, I'd be interested to know what his what his third win was, but we'll see. We'll have to uh, we'll have to see that later. Anyways, <laughs> moving on. We're moving on to North Carolina, and okay. Coach Mac Brown is coming back for his fourth year with the North Carolina Tar Heels. Uh, last year they started off in the uh, in the polls at number ten, and then uh, had a little flippy flop, flop flop. 
last year. They finished six and seven overall, three and five in the ACC play. Uh, recruiting wise, they've had three straight top 15 classes. Uh, anything stand out here? From- yeah, I, I think you mentioned it there. there. There's some interesting stuff going on here, particularly with the recruiting classes. They're starting to string some recruiting classes together. Uh, I think the future is fairly bright, but no one can really deny that last year was a pretty disappointing year going in with the expectations that they had. Um, and, and halfway def- decent offense. And some of those expectations before you move on mm-hmm. was they had what they thought was a was a just a big time quarterback with yeah. Howell, who's yeah. now gone. Uh, Heisman Trophy hopes were there, um, but then a number ten preseason poll everything all the hype was there yeah but, i mean and you mentioned the quarterback situation i mean now there's question marks for the quarterback they they got to choose between a couple sophomores uh to 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 run to call the plays and um like i said though i think that the optimism is there's a point there's reason to have optimism uh in north carolina right now uh but i don't necessarily know that they're going to – they, well, it's questionable whether they're going to make it to a bowl game. We'll say that. I think they're right on the bubble. Yeah. Pretty much like they were last year. Um, big key to their offense is that they have a star wide receiver coming back and Josh Downs. Mm-hmm. Um, their defense underperformed kind of Mac Brown's calling card. He brings in Gene – Chiswick, yep. To head up their defense, try to shore that up a little bit. Yep. Um, the coastal division. Let's be honest, man. And when we're looking at it from a giraffe point of view, very yep. high level point of view, the coastal division seems like it's open. It's open season yeah. for someone to step up and take it. I think Carolina has the pieces that they could contend in the coastal. We'll see what our predictions are. Yeah, it's interesting in the Coastal Division. I mean, the question that I have is, is there really that team that stands out that much more than the others? And I guess we'll see. But, I mean, at first glance, I don't know that there is. So, starting yeah. off, I'll start us off here. I've got them uh, going 6-6. Six and six. I think they will be bowl eligible. Um, but I think it's going to be a fight. Like you said, there's just not much separating a lot of these teams. So it's going to be interesting to see kind of how some of these games play out. I'm, I have a little more optimism. Okay. I think if they can figure out and be steady Eddie at quarterback, the schedule kind of lines up, right? Yep. The ACC coastal, of course, lines up, right? When you get to play Duke and Georgia tech every year. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm going to go out there and say North Carolina 8-4. and four. Holy snikes. I think they'll be well man, within the bowl reach and a very good season. Uh, Parker's, uh, Parker's picks, 7-5. and five. So we're all there. We think they're a bowl team. Yep. Ranging anywhere from 8 to 6 wins. Yep. Um, could I think be that, a good, I, honestly, productive season for Mac Brown in his fourth year. I, I It wouldn't surprise me if they went 8-4. and four. Again, like I said, there's just not a ton separating these teams. So it's like there's a bunch of 50-50 games. Yeah, it's, it's like one little thing. Injuries always play a big role, but yeah. there's going to be like one little thing that can make a team go from nine wins down yeah. to five. I mean, yeah. it's just totally, totally totally luck. Yep. Virginia. Virginia. Under new coach, Tony Elliott, former Clemson offensive coordinator coming in here. Um, he has some offensive firepower, but the O line is an absolute concern. And let me tell you why he has to replace all five starters on his offensive line. And I think as we've seen growing up, the lines are a big deal. They're not the sexy position, but offensive line, defensive line, they set up the ones that are sexy and make the plays. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, losing your entire offensive line, unless you are a perennial powerhouse that literally just carries loads and loads of five-star offensive linemen, 
it's hard to turn over your entire offensive line and have any expectation to be able to um, protect the quarterback and to establish any kind of run game uh, just because of the lack of cohesion uh, amongst them. I mean, and look, Virginia, they, they can – they can sling the ball yeah, around. Tell a little us bit. about their quarterback. Even last year, yeah, I three mean, to one ratio. Yeah, I mean, over four thousand yards. Uh, oh, passing. Brendan Armstrong, we're talking yeah. about you, Brendan Armstrong. Yeah, uh, over over four thousand yards passing, sixty five plus per, uh, pass percentage, uh, one fifty six rating. That's really good. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's, that's 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 pretty next level. I you've mean, got, they, you've got the quarterback, but they but you did while he was upright. You did while you had your offensive line. That's the big question yeah. that I that I uncovered in my research is having to replace all five is very very rare. Mm-hmm. I, I, don't I, I don't know. I don't like the way that that sounds, <laughs> uh, particularly when their defense is not really that strong. You know, they look at their defense; they're giving up over 450 yards a game. Um, and they ranked in the bottom third of colleges and defense 104 out of 130. Um, so, I mean, it, it's, I don't know, man, again, there's not a ton separating a lot of these teams. I think this is another six and 16. What does their schedule have here? So it's we're got starting the, off with Richmond. Yeah. Then they're going to, uh, Illinois. Illinois. That's a, that's a 50, 50 game. Yeah. We, I, we've done the research on yeah, Illinois and I Illinois know. is, on the uptick, too. I mean, Virginia. Yeah, and then we're going to Old Dominion and Syracuse, then Duke, Louisville, Georgia Tech, Miami. I've got them beating the Tar Heels and Pitt. Coastal Carolina, and then closing out with Virginia Tech. Okay. We're going to see. All right. I've got them at six, six and six, bowl eligible. A lot of 50-50 games in here. So that's many 50-50 games. That's what they 50. finished last year. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's just more of the same. When I went through the schedule. Now, let me say this. Yeah. If that O-line can hold up, this could be your dark horse right here. It could be. This could be the dark horse in the coast. Just like we said with North Carolina, this division is up for grabs. Virginia could just as easily grab it as what we just said with North Carolina. <laughs> yep. Totally. Uh, Virginia's got the proven quarterback. North Carolina doesn't. Exactly. Virginia's got proven wide receivers. Yep. They absolutely do. But the problem is five offensive linemen are new. That 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 hurts. And I can't keep thinking about that when I'm going through win loss, win loss. That's why Oof. I'm predicting six. I'll have Virginia yeah, making a We're right game. there together. I do again, though. I do think that Virginia could be one of those sleeper teams. Yeah, we're going to stay in the state. We're going to Virginia Tech. Hokey, hokey. Six and seven last year. Four and four in ACC play. Coach Brent Pry has a roster that needs more talent. Again, in my research, I found that both lines need an upgrade. Um, that's going to make for, again, a lot of 50-50 games. When you have holes in both the offensive line and defensive line, it's just hard to consistently pick you as, I think you can win. It's just, I go back and forth with teams like this. Yeah, and it's always tough whenever a team has to go through a coach departing midway, you know, partway through the season. Uh, Justin Fuente, uh, it's just clear that he got into a situation that he was not ready for. Um not a very good offense, which is what he was known for. Halfway decent defense, but you know the the lack of production really on offensive la- offense last year is just th- this is kind of a teardown for me. Uh, Virginia Tech is I, I, again though they're in the right division that they can still hang around and still get bowl eligible in my opinion. Um, but just looking at their defensive numbers and offensive numbers, they're going to have to tear everything down here and start over. Um, hopefully uh, Brent Pry can bring some luck down there to him and uh, turn things around. Just think about these last three teams, Virginia Tech, Virginia, North Carolina. They may just beat up each other. They may all just round See, robin that, I and mean, just that's cancel what each I, other out. Exactly. That's kind of what I'm thinking is going to happen. I mean, because those three teams in particular, there's just not that much separating them. 
There's just really not. There's so many 50-50 games that if a Virginia, say, go, you know, say uh, uh, has their offensive line step up and get some get the job done, all of a sudden one of those teams stands out. And it's going to be interesting to see how this this uh, division plays out if one of those teams makes that step forward. In an earlier podcast, you talked about how you like their atmosphere, game day mm-hmm. atmosphere with their fans. It seems like their fans yep. are getting a little restless, though. They, yeah. they want to see more production. I just don't think this is the year. No, I mean, they're going to have to be a little bit patient. Um, yes, Blacksburg is a very special place to play. Uh, the hype that gets going there pregame uh, and right as the, the players are being introduced is second to none. Uh, it's always something that they show on, on, on the national uh, stage uh, with Metallica playing, uh, you know, inter Sandman. It, it, there's nothing better as far as I'm concerned, but they're going to have to be patient this year. Like I said, this awesome. is not the year. This is a transition year for them. I encourage the students and the fans to keep that energy going. That's a lot about what college football is. The mm-hmm. fans make up a lot of the college atmosphere. Continue the energy. Your team's going to need it. And hell, some of that energy might just push them over in some of those 50 50 games. Yeah. Uh, it could. It could play yeah. a big role. Um, you've got their schedule pulled up here. What did, did you see anything? Any trends? Or is it back and forth type of year? You know, it's they have probably. I think they're on the lower the lower part of these these the list of three we just mentioned. Um, I really do think that they need tremendously to be able to reestablish a culture. And there's a lot of talk in college football about culture, how important it is. When we talk about how special it is to play in Blacksburg and the introduction and the fan base and how riled up that they get, they have to be able to find somebody that fits Blacksburg, that fits Virginia Tech Hokies. Uh, I never really, I th- always thought that, you know, Justin Fuente was a weird pick. I thought that Fu- I thought Fuente was like a perfect fit for Memphis whenever he was in Memphis because he can kind of fly under the radar a little bit. Well, when you go to Virginia Tech, now you're taking a big step up and the spotlight's going to be on you. Uh, and, but the point is about the culture here is, is again, fan base has to just continue to do what they do to be a rowdy fan base, to stay supportive of your of your program, they're going to find the right guy, I promise, because there's people lining up probably to uh, be the head coach at Virginia Tech. Uh, this squad, this university has averaged 6.25 wins per year in the last four years. I love stats and I love trends, so I see 6.25 I see this team as a 50-50 team. I'm just going to stay right there with it. I'm going Virginia Tech 6-6 six and six and bowl eligible. Parker picks 5-7 and seven and that you miss playing in the postseason bowl game. What have you, Blake? Well, I think it is going to come down to that very last game there. Uh, Ooh, Virginia. Yeah, but I, I ultimately I think they're going 6-6. Six and six. Uh, but I think because I, I'm kind of giving them the benefit of the doubt on a couple of games throughout the year. So I'm, I'm giving them bowl eligibility. All right. Now we're going to talk about a team that resides in Florida. The Miami Hurricanes, the U. New head coach, Mario Cristobal. He is their third coach since 2016. This, this program needs a little stability. Uh, Charlie Strong joins the staff after the uh, Urban Meyer debacle in the Jacksonville Jaguars. He's probably headed back to a way better situation here. He gets to go back to college. He stays in the state of Florida. Uh, Miami has also got on staff pro football Hall of Famers Jason Taylor and Ed Reed. So that, they're trying to do a culture shift here again. Yeah, you know. Like you said, Mario Cristobal is uh he's got him he's found himself in possession of a team that appears to be pretty strong on paper. Uh quarterback Tyler Van Dyke, he really elevated the team's offense when he uh took over halfway through the year in the 2021 season, averaging the team averaged over 36 points per game when after he took over. Um but as always, you know, I mean, this is this is the thing that that I fear. 
is is this just more South Beach South Beach bluster? You know, there's always some hype every three or four years. It seems like it down in Miami. You know, we hear about it whenever Mark Rick takes o- takes over. Uh, <laughs> Mark Rick, <laughs> and and then that didn't really work out. Uh, now, I mean, is Tyler Van Dyke kind of the big um, the wild card here because he tre- he was a tremendous lift for this offense, and the numbers that he put up in ten games was. Pretty impressive. You, we're looking at a 62% uh, completion rate, uh, 25 touchdowns to, to six interceptions, 160 passer rating, uh, almost 3,000 yards. I mean, this this guy's the real deal, I think. Could you build around that? Uh, that is the big question. Um, I'm kind of interested to see what's going to happen down there in South Beach. I think that they're going to have a really, really good year this year. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a text message from one Matthew Two-Tone Blue Parker. Okay. Please allow me to read his notes about the U. He says, Miami, this team is a new recruiting juggernaut. Recruiting. (laughs) Yep. Tyler Van Dyke is literally getting top three NFL draft hype for next year's draft. I'm even seeing some mocks with him going number one overall. New coach, super hyped. He brings in two donors with a billion, with a B, billion dollar deep pockets, which is really going to help the NIL recruiting efforts. We've talked about the NIL many times on this show. Miami joined the ACC in 2004. They've won 10 games just one time. Oh, wow. I know this team is super hyped, and we don't have time to go into these teams super in depth. If someone really wants us to break down a team position by position, let me know because Parker will do it. Yeah, he will. I'll be happy to do a team specific breakdown in a team specific podcast. So he has some interest in your university there. Parker's going nine and three this year, which might seem low to some fans listening, but he says the next couple of years could see this win total climb into the double digits. Parker's I, bullish. Yeah. On the I, U. I, I uh, could not agree more with everything he just said there. I've got them going nine and three as well. Uh, I think that the outlook is very good. I think that um, they just have to keep it going. They got to keep the momentum going. They can't, they need Tyler Van Dyke to come out and ball out. If he comes out and balls out like he did at the end or the middle of the year last year, sky's the limit. There could be, there could be some serious damage being done down on South beach. I want to see a little more out of your defense. Um, I mentioned at the top of this bookmark segment, Jason Taylor and Ed Reed have a hand in this, in this new efforts, hall of fame defenders playing football. Yep. I'm going eight and four and it may just be good enough to win the coastal. As you've already heard, I've got North Carolina going eight and four as well. I'll decide at the end of this podcast which team gets the tiebreaker. <laughs> well, you're going to have to make your mind up quick because now we've only we're got one on, more team. Moving on to Pitt now. We've only got one more team left. Pitt finished last year at a remarkable 11 and three, seven and one in ACC play. Coach Pat Narduzzi gets a huge. Huge extension through the year 2030. It was the most victories in the last 40 years, hearkening back to the Dan Marino era, Blake. That's what they were able to accomplish. Last yeah, year. an unbelievable season last year led by Kenny Pickett, who has now gone to the NFL. Parker loves some Kenny Pickett. Yeah, old tiny hands Pickett, as he calls him. Mm. Uh, but I'm looking at this for the 2022 season. And with the loss of so many key positions, 
on offense, they're going to have a hard time this year. I think, you know, again, I mentioned Kenny Pickett. He's gone to the NFL. Jordan Addison, he transferred to USC. Offensive coordinator, he left for Nebraska. That is quite the overhaul. Now, they brought in, they got a quarterback in the transfer portal from USC, right? Yeah, but, I mean, this is the thing. As much as we rag on Kenny Pickett, he was a good college quarterback. Not just a good college quarterback. He might have been a great college quarterback. He's a Heisman finalist. I don't think that we're going to need to expect too much from Pitt this year. I think they're maybe taking two, maybe three steps, steps back this year. Mm. What say you? So 11 and three, I'm definitely not predicting a repeat of that. Nope. No. No, 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 no. I'm going, uh, they are the third team in the coastal that I'm saying is going eight and four. And I will decide at the end of this podcast, which of those three teams that I have at eight and four will win the coastal. Yeah. I am going for a solid seven and five (laughs) by the Pittsburgh Panthers highlighted by a key loss of a a, a revenge win from the Tennessee volunteers in their week two matchup. So I am uh, a wait. That's a home game. Yep. That's a home. Yeah. You think that the volunteers are going to come up into pit. I think that that they still play at Heinz or wait, it's not Heinz field anymore. Yeah. I don't even know what it is. It's some kind of, I can't even remember. Something unforgettable or something forgettable, rather. I added in a note from a previous podcast. Yeah, you did. But. Whatever. Whatever. Seven and five. Book it. Parker says eight and four, and I'm sure he has them losing to the to the Vols as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess it's time for me to decide who's winning the Coastal. Yep. Uh, Parker has the U. Miami, as do I. As do I. Winning the Coastal. I've got Miami at eight and four, Pitt at eight and four, North Carolina at eight and four. Why the hell not? Let me just go North Carolina and Mac Brown. Wow. That they is will that represent is, the coastal. You are going out on a limb, my friend. Goodness gra- are you feeling okay? Goodness gracious. He's drinking the Kool-Aid. That's what it is. He's drinking that Tar Heel Kool-Aid. I'm drinking some Oktoberfest is that, what I'm drinking. That's what it is. Well, there you That's go. That's a coastal prediction That's show. That's a coastal prediction show there, guys. We really appreciate you joining us. Uh, again, on your way out, go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button. It's quick, it's free, and it's easy, and it really helps us out. Go ahead and uh, hit the Rumble button on Rumble. Check us out on all of our social media, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. Download all the audio versions of these podcasts on your favorite podcasting platform. Newberry, final thoughts. I encourage everyone to stay tuned to the ACC Atlantic podcast. We thank you for watching this all the way through. Even if you skip through to find your favorite spots, we appreciate your time and listening to us. Stay with us throughout the football season. We'll be talking about some of your favorite teams throughout. Absolutely, guys. Be sure to stay tuned. We're going to have probably a couple more of these uh, different conference conferences. Uh, prediction shows uh, before we get started this year in the in the college football season and we uh, again we really appreciate you watching and as always it is two-tone blue all the way you guys be well be well